Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, and happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. Some of y'all got caught off guard by that, didn't you? You said, wait a minute, wasn't that? But how many of you are glad that we live on this side of the resurrection? We live on this side of the empty tomb. And so Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is not just a Sunday that we celebrate one Sunday out of the year. We remember that Jesus got up now. Every day is Resurrection Sunday, this side of the tomb. Amen? So happy Resurrection Sunday, church. Really looking forward to getting in this message with us. So um, we're just going to get straight into the word. In case we haven't got a chance to meet, my name is Tellus. Um, I have the opportunity to pastor here at this church. And we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 43 this morning. Just one verse. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. And if you can and you're able, would you stand with me in the reading of God's word? The reason why we stand is because we acknowledge the word of God as the primary authority over our lives, therefore deserves our respect. So we stand in the reading of God's word. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, just one verse. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I want to title this message something really simple. The title of the message is, But Now, Who Am I? Would you pray with me for a minute? Oh, Lord Jesus. Remind us, Lord, that there is one person that we're gathered here for. And it's not anybody in these seats or anybody on this stage, but it is you. You are the guest and the host. Lord, if you are not glorified in any other place, would you be glorified in this place? And oh Lord, if you were not glorified in any other heart, would you be glorified in this heart? Father, we love you so much. And more importantly, you love us. Holy Spirit, empower us to live, look, and love more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. (sighs) Amen. Who am I? This is probably the most pressing question in our culture today. The idea or the question of who am I? Something that my generation absolutely has really grabbed onto and started this whole discussion of identity. I was the youth pastor here for a few years, five years before, and As I was the youth pastor, something that youth pastors always tend to talk about is this idea of identity. And I think rightfully so, that we understand that uh, for young people, specifically when I was pastoring high school and middle school, that it's crucial that they would start with a right identity of who they are. And Pastor Adrian and I were talking about this before, and we're saying it's so interesting that we see the importance of having young people start out with a right identity. But why don't we often talk about adults in our identity? And I think it's because we know the importance of speaking to a middle schooler or a high schooler so they start out with the right identity, but it's different when you're talking to an adult who has settled into their identity. That all of us probably already have one, to be honest. We are, at least we think we have one. Or we're already walking in one. But I wonder if it's your right, God-given identity. We're going to take a look at 
uh, influential family in the scriptures to talk about that exact topic because we are obsessed with talking about who we are, who am I, my identity. That's why we take like the Myers-Briggs and the Strength Finders and the Enneagrams and the DISC profiles and the astrologies because we're trying to figure out like who am I really? So we look for something else to tell me about who I am. And by the way, we don't recommend astrology. If you're doing it, stop. (laughs) But we look for a lot of different areas Probably because we're desperate, because we don't actually know who we are. This idea of identity is crucial because identity first, you have to understand, before you can have any security or actually change in any meaningful way. If you want to be secure, you first need to have a true and right identity. And if you want to change You need a solid identity. Why? Because everything that comes out of you first started inside of you. You actually are a human being more than you are a human doing. Because your doing always comes out of your being. But your being, friend, does not come out of your doing. Some of us still try to do things so that we might become something. The scriptures give a better way that you now are something, and out of who you are is what you do. We've all met people who have uh, looked around their lives and changed everything and circumstances and people and jobs, and they keep ending up in the same place over and over and over again. And I think we all know the answer is because the issue is you can change everything around you, but wherever you go, Know who you bring with you. You. (laughs) And so people always say, man, people are ruining my life, or this job's ruining my life, or this is ruining my life. No, I'm ruining my life. (laughs) Because wherever I go, I bring me with me. And if I look for just the circumstances to come in and change what's on the inside of me, instead of me bringing a new self into different circumstances, I will never actually change. If we rely on outer things to change me on the inside, I will always remain the same. Your being, your doing comes out of your being. Your being does not come out of your doing. So I need to figure out who am I. The idea of identity, though, first, before I answer the question, who am I? The idea of identity first starts with possession. Because before I ask and answer who am I, I first need to ask and answer whose am I? Because if I am my own, then I have authority to decide who I am. If I am my own, then I have authority to decide who I am. It's this idea that culture will essentially, if I'm in charge, give me a buffet of options to choose from, and whichever one looks best to me, I choose and then become. And so if culture says that politics, race, or or ethnicity, or family, or job, or money, or status is a good identity, then I, being my own, will choose that and place it upon myself. But if I am God's, then I do not choose who I am. God gifts me with an identity. Identity is so interesting because historically, identity would be... um, like through family, like you didn't, identity was interesting because you knew who you were by your country, your family, your tribe, or your nation. That's where you got your identity. And most even like different countries that aren't Western, individualized, intro, uh, just self-obsessed cultures like we are, we always look at ourselves and we define ourselves. So we have this idea that like, oh, that's old time or that's a different culture. That's wrong for the family to decide who I am. No, we as a culture rebel against that idea. And we say, nobody can decide who I am, not even my family, my culture, my nation, my tribe. Only I can decide who I am. I decide who I am by feelings. I figure out, I earn and work for an identity. And friend, I would tell you there is a better way. 
There's a better way to get an identity than simply being born into one that you have no choice in or working for one that you only get when you feel. I would say the better identity is not one that you were born into that was forced upon you or one that you have worked to deserve. The better identity is the identity that Christ had died for you to have. There is an identity, friend, that you do not work for and you are not born into, but an identity that Christ died to give you. This Christian identity is the only identity that is received and not achieved. Something that's given to you, not worked for by you. And if I am his, then therefore he has authority over me. He gets to decide how I feel about me. And this will set some of us free because if you are Christ's, then you do not get to decide who you are. Christ does. Your feelings do not get to decide who you are. Culture will tell you, you, however you feel, is actually your true self. Actually, the scriptures would say, If you are Christ's, that is no longer your responsibility. And it is actually good and obedient to actually agree with what God says about you. You no longer have the weight to wake up every day and figure out, who am I? Wake up every new season and say, who am I? Wake up at every job, relationship, and interesting season in your life with interesting mindsets and interesting spaces and places and people and say, who am I? It has been decided for you. You are, if you're in Christ, his. You, if you're in Christ, have an identity that's received and not achieved. It's so important because if we don't understand that, we will attempt to relabel what God has already labeled. And when you do that, friend, you remove him from the place of God and you insert yourself. It is actually obedient to agree with what God says about you. Not prideful. But now, it says in Isaiah chapter 43, but now, this... Very, very interesting book Isaiah is. And before we get to the but now, we have to look at the back then. Back then in Isaiah chapter 43, this book entirely is almost like a microcosm of the Holy Bible. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah, 66 books in the Bible. There's split in the scriptures, the Old Testament or Old Covenant and the New Testament or New Covenant. And in Isaiah, you have it split in a way that's 39 books on essentially... um, Isaiah prophesying uh, correction to Israel over and over and rebuke to Israel over and over and over and over and over again. And then you cut to the second half of Isaiah, 27 books later, and then you see this redeemed vision of what Israel is going to be, that God redeems all of the burnt and broken places and a shoot of Jesse hope is going to come from Israel. It's this microcosm of the whole story of the scriptures. And interestingly enough, Isaiah gives us some of those potent prophecies about Jesus coming in this book. Isaiah chapter 43 is what we're talking about, but Isaiah chapter 42 is where God is rebuking Israel Because he's saying, you guys, you're not who you're supposed to be because you are hearing me, but you're not listening to me. Like you're watching me, but you're not seeing me. There was this disconnect with who Israel was and what Israel was doing. Doing. And then it gets to this point that uh, 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 holds this tension, and the scriptures beautifully hold the tension that says, um, The scriptures do not ignore who you were, these scriptures just emphasize who you are. The scriptures know, yes, we all have a past. Israel had this past, and now Yahweh is affirming and anointing and emphasizing who they are. Listen, a better way to change is always saying, that's not who I am, not that's not what I do. If you're looking for sustainable change in your life and you keep saying, that's not what I do, that's not what I do, that's not what I do, that is not going to help you, friend. Because, why? Your doing always comes out of your being. Your being does not come out of your doing. A more sustainable way of change, friend, that is not who I am. Not, that is not what I do. Isaiah 43, but 
now. And we get to this point where it says, he who created you, O Jacob. We're going to use Jacob as the platform on which we talk about identity. And specifically, we're going to look through his life. It's going to be Genesis 27 through 33. Obviously, we can't go to every single passage. But when you look at it later, Genesis 27 through 33 is where we're going to be traveling. And we are going to go into Jacob's story. Deep, Deep breath in. Now, deep breath out. Get ready. He's, this is crazy. The scriptures tell a very honest story about humanity. And in the way that when the scriptures hold up a person, we like to categorize them in two different categories. That makes it easy for us. Good people and bad people. The scriptures don't put people in those categories like that. The scriptures don't say good people and bad people. The scriptures just say humans. (laughs) <laughs> because even the really good humans, the ones who follow Jesus, still fail in monumental ways. And sometimes the bad humans really follow God. And you're like, what's going on? I thought that they were the bad ones. But they, yeah, the scriptures don't really have these categories. And if we want to put categories in them, the category that we can find is God and us. That's the category. And so when we look at Jacob, we look at his whole family, and it is a complex family. Not full of good people and bad people, but full of humans. Are they good? Yeah. Are they bad? Yeah. Are they loved? Oh, yeah. Jacob, he's the son of Isaac, Isaac is the son of Abraham. So you remember Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, so, and so are you. So let's all praise our Lord. Right hand, right? So we all know Abraham's the guy, right? And so Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had a son, Jacob. This is like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the family. Jacob is born, and Jacob has a twin brother named Esau. So Isaac, this covenant promise that God makes to Abraham, travels through the family, and Isaac has two sons, twins, named Jacob and Esau. Esau is the older brother. Esau is this man's man. Uh, The scriptures define him as like this hairy hunter, man's man who loves to go out, and he's the favorite of his dad, Isaac. And then his twin brother, Jacob, is this, uh, he's like a homebody. Like his mom loves him. He's a mama's boy. He loves being in the tent. That's literally what the scriptures say. And so he loves just like staying home, being with mom. That's Jacob. They're totally different. But Esau's born first, just a few minutes ahead. As Esau's born, it says that Jacob grabs the heel of Esau, essentially trying to be born first as they're born. He gets the name Jacob, which means usurper. He grabs the heel. As Jacob is born, they have this very interesting relationship with their parents where Esau, the man's man, is his dad's favorite. Jacob, the mama's boy, is his mom's favorite. Esau goes out to hunt one day, doesn't catch anything, comes back to his brother Jacob, says, I didn't catch anything. I'm going to die. Please give me some soup. Jacob is like, yeah, for sure, bro. I got you. Come sit down. Here's what the bowl of soup costs. Give me your birthright. What? (laughs) Esau's like, okay. He gives him his birthright, his inheritance, just gives it away for a bowl of soup. He gives away the birthright. Now, Jacob is now the one with the inheritance. But Jacob still has to go and convince his dad to give him the double blessing. So then Jacob, with the approval and actually the encouragement of his mom, says, go and trick your dad into giving you the double blessing. So he puts on like fur to trick his dad to think that he's Esau because his dad's blind. So he goes in the tent for his dad and he's like, hey. And then Isaac, the dad, is like, you don't sound like Esau. Are you Esau? He's like, yeah. He's like, you smell like Esau. But he's like, you don't, here, let me touch you. And he touches them. And because Esau's so hairy and Jacob put hair on himself, Isaac thinks Jacob is Esau. He goes and he tricks his dad. His dad blesses him, gives him the double portion. Now, all of the sudden, Jacob is now the person through whom the covenant is going to go. It was supposed to be the firstborn. So the scriptures were supposed to go, the covenant of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob lives up to his name. 
he's usurping. His life is marked by taking what he wants. He sees something and he takes that thing. He sees that Esau is weak and he says, give me a blessing and gets blessed by Esau. He looks at his dad, sees that his dad is weak and with the help of his mom gets blessed by his dad. All of a sudden, this creates issues, no doubt. He gets issues, and then all of a sudden we see uh, Jacob living up to this name, which is why it's so important. Let's go back to Isaiah 43. It says, but now he who created you, O Jacob. Did you know that God created Jacob? And I don't just mean the person Jacob. I mean God created Jacob's. Jacob, you have a Jacob, and I have a Jacob. The part of us that... We don't really want anybody else to see. The part of us that we're not really proud of. The part of us that's really good at getting what we want if we really want it, but not in the right way. The part of us that we would rather hide when we come into church than be totally honest. The part of us that's really, really embarrassing and doesn't really look like Christ. The part of us that, to be honest, we are collectively all ashamed of and try and push down. We all have a Jacob. But now, he who created you, O Jacob. Did you know that God has authority over Jacob? Remember, whoever ha- who's, whosoever you are is who has authority over you. God created Jacob. God has authority over Jacob. Some of us in this room would think that God is only the God of the good parts of me. But he is not the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the bad parts of me. He doesn't want the Jacob in me. But yet Isaiah prophesies from the mouth of God that he created Jacob. Therefore, he has authority over Jacob. Jacob is the part that we want to forget. Jacob is the part that we hate. And let me encourage you, if you're sitting in this room and you're saying, man, another message that just makes me feel bad about the person that I used to be and what I used to do and how I used to act, be encouraged because the mercy of God is enough for your past. The mercy of God is enough for your present and the mercy of God is enough for your future. He who created you, O oh, Jacob. He created us, and then it says, He formed Israel and He redeemed you. You see, before Jacob could do what he was called to do, Jacob first had to learn who he was called to be. Purpose and identity are so interesting, they are fused together. Purpose and identity, they're fused together. But one always comes first, identity. Purpose and identity are fused together, but identity always comes first. He formed Israel. Has he formed you? Because we can be in this room praising God, worshiping him, calling ourselves Christians, and yet unformed by God. Because we are forming ourselves, our family is forming us, our spouse is forming us, the culture is forming us, our news is forming us. We can be formed by many things, friends. Has he formed you? He wants to. Formation, though, is way more than just calling. Formation is also character. Like, we think, when God forms me, God is forming me to be all that I'm supposed to be so I can do all that I'm supposed to do. And yes, he does want you to do incredible things. God has a plan and a purpose for your life that is so much better than your plan and your purpose for your life. He wants you to have an incredible calling. But the issue is, some of us want to walk into our calling without our character. Why that matters, and listen to me, I love you. Why that matters is because, you know when I say that, it's going to be rough. So I love you. (laughs) Why I say that is because Christians do not always have the best reputation. And this is why I think it's because we try and walk in our calling without our character. You live your life in the world saying the truth however it comes and hoping, knowing people ought to listen to you because I'm telling the truth. I'm right. I have the word of God. I'm not wrong. 
and you start walking in your calling without your character and expect people to listen to you. You are right, friend. But it is very hard to receive truth from a hypocrite. Even though it is true. And when you walk in your calling, saying the truth of God, without your character, without the fruits of the Spirit, you force people to receive truth from a hypocrite. Ought they? Yes, it's true. But how difficult are you making their life? Purpose and identity are fused, but one has to come first. You have to have a right identity before you try and run into your purpose. And this is why even some of us have like difficult Christian lives is because we're living like contradicting lives. Like we try and walk in purpose without identity. And so we're forcing ourselves to, to try and do what God calls to do without being who God called us to be. And this is why some of us have a hard time following Jesus. And that's why some people have a hard time following Jesus because they see us do that. They see us Say what Jesus says without doing what Jesus does. Purpose and identity are fused. But one must come first, friends. We must be who God has called us to be without, before we do what God has called us to do. He created... Jacob, Jacob, after he uh, steals the birthright from his brother and then tricks his dad, his family looks at him and his mom and his dad are like, yeah, you, you screwed up. He hates you. You got to go. So Jacob runs away to his uncle's house, Laban. He goes to Laban's house and all of a sudden he finds out that Laban has two daughters. Get ready, guys. This story is wild. He has two daughters, Laban does. You know the story, so you know where I'm going. Jacob goes and meets Laban. He's like, hey, I got to hang out here for a minute because my family's crazy back home. Like, I just got to be here. Is that cool? Laban's like, yeah, for sure, come in. Laban's a shepherd, has a ton of sheep, a ton of flock. As soon as Jacob comes in, he sees his daughter, Rachel. And he's like, yo, Rachel's beautiful. It says that he loves Rachel. Then he looks at Leah. Leah's not as beautiful. He looks at them both, not me, that's what the Bible says. He looks at them both, and then he says, Laban, I want to marry your daughter, Rachel. The issue is Rachel was the second born. So Laban's like, yeah, 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 you can marry Rachel. Awesome. He's like, what do I need to do? He's like, work for me for seven years, and then you can marry Rachel. He's like, I love her so much, I'll do that. Great guy. <laughs> then what he does... He works for seven years. Laban tricks Jacob, and instead of giving Jacob Rachel, he gives Rachel Leah to marry. <laughs> Jacob wakes up. He's like, whoa, 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 hold on. You told me that I was going to get Rachel. He's like, yeah, but like the older daughter has to be married first, and Leah's older, so you had to marry her. But you can still marry Rachel if you want. Just work another seven years. <laughs> Jake, uh, Jacob loves Rachel so much, he says, I'll work another seven years. Now he has sister wives. <laughs> so Jacob now has two wives. He doesn't love Leah. He loves Rachel. He gets in this, whole, this very, very difficult relationship triangle, marriage triangle, and then he says, man, I got to get out of here. He, he leaves. He starts to leave Laban, but before he leaves Laban, he, uh, long story short, read it, Genesis like 28, 29, he tricks Laban and essentially takes a bunch of his sheep, goes and leaves in the middle of the night. Laban wakes up. He's like, where did they go? He has this issue now with Laban after he has manipulated Laban, gets the blessing that he could from him so that he gets what he wants. Jacob lives up to his name yet again. You see, Jacob so desperately wanted to bless himself that he did anything he had to to do it. Did you know that the scriptures never say that you are responsible to bless you? That doesn't mean that you're not allowed to do something for yourself. That means that it is not your responsibility to bless yourself. It is only and always God's responsibility to bless you. 
The issue is that Jacob did not know who he was, so he started blessing himself, manipulating a blessing and thinking, I know what's best for me, so I'm going to make my life so conducive for blessing that no matter what happens, I'm going to make sure that I'm blessed. The issue is that, yes, Jacob was blessed, but not by God. He was blessed by Esau, yeah. He was blessed by Isaac, yeah. He was blessed by Rachel. He was blessed by Leah. He was even blessed by Laban. But Jacob was not blessed by God. A lot of us would love to be launched into our purpose without having a true identity. And friend, it is the grace and mercy of God that you do not go into your purpose without your identity. It is not him withholding a good thing from you. This is his protection for you because Jacob almost ruined, Jacob almost killed himself, blessing himself. That's not an exaggeration. I'm not like hyperbole. No, he almost died. Because he was so obsessed with blessing himself that he almost killed himself because of it. It is the grace of God, friend, that we not walk into our purpose without our identity. Because the reality is your doing comes out of your being. Your being does not come out of your doing. Some of us, we don't like this. We, we want to be blessed by God and to be honest, or we want to be blessed by people and to be honest, it's so much easier to be blessed by people. Like you can see being blessed by people. It's harder to see being blessed by God because sometimes God's blessing over your life is his approval of your actions. And you just knowing after you go to bed that night, God was happy with what you did. And sometimes it's harder to receive that blessing than it is to receive people's blessing. And I think it's because of this. To be blessed by man, it takes no faith, but it does take action. And to be blessed by God, it takes little action, but it does take faith. Jacob was obsessed with being blessed by man. So he leaves Laban. And he leaves Laban's house with Rachel and with Leah and with all of his children and all of his cattle and all of his livestock. And then he runs away. And then it gets to this point where he actually sees and hears that guess what? Guess who's back? Esau. He hears from one of his servants, hey, bro, Esau's on his way. And here's the part that we didn't talk about the story. The part of the story, it says that Esau was so mad at Jacob that the only thought that made Esau happy was killing Jacob. That's how mad he was. 20 years later, he's like, I'm so mad. All I want to do is kill my brother. So Jacob ends up in this place where he has blessed himself by himself by manipulating his way into every blessing he can think of. And now he's at this point. Esau's over here trying to kill him. So he says, you know what? I got to separate my family. He goes to this river called the Jabbok and he gets to the Jabbok and he says, Rachel, you go on this side with these kids. Leah, you go on this side with these kids. If Esau comes after us, at least one side of my family will live. And then we get to Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. And it says simply this, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. This man we know is uh, pre-incarnate Christ. It's what theologians call it Christophany. So he's wrestling actually with God himself. This verse Genesis 32, 24 is so important that Jacob was left alone and then a man wrestled with him. Some of us don't like being alone because we have to encounter ourselves and God. So we would rather fill our lives with our lives and do everything we can to make sure we don't have any empty space that, my, that I can fill or that God can fill. 
So we start filling our lives with busyness and stuff and doing everything that we can to make ourselves blessed. But notice that God only deals with Jacob when he's by himself. And not just by himself, but listen to this. He goes to the Jabbok. The word Jabbok, that river, that stream, literally means the place of emptiness. So listen to this. Jacob comes. Esau's running after him, wants to kill him. Rachel's on that side. Leah's on this side. He is alone at night and empty. And then God encounters him. If you want to receive a true identity and an encounter from God, you need to first get alone with God. And some of us think that emptiness is a bad thing. We think that if I have nothing to offer, then I am not good for anything. You have been taught that if you need to be carried, then you are simply a burden. But in the scriptures, let me tell you that if you are empty, it is an invitation for God to fill you because he has no use for full vessels, friends. If you're empty... If you're alone, congratulations, you are in the perfect space for an encounter with God. When Jacob was alone, he wrestles with the man. When he's empty, he wrestles with the man. And this is the weirdest wrestling match in the history of the world. Because you get Jacob wrestling with God. And after he's wrestling with him, it says all night, it says that Jacob wouldn't stop fighting. God says, man, I know that you're not going to give up. And then God says, let go of me. Jacob says to God, I will not let go until you bless me. Then God says, who are you? It's the weirdest wrestling match ever. He says, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. God says, who are you? This is so crucial, though, because this moment right here, the reason is because as soon as God encounters Jacob, everything changes. This is the moment where after he's done wrestling with God, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. This is the moment that Jacob gets a new identity. And this is so crucial because Jacob finally says a pivotal moment in his life. I'm not going to let go until you bless me. This is so important because this is the first time in Jacob's whole life where he is more ambitious about the blessing of God than the blessing of man. He's been blessed by men his whole life. He's been blessed by Esau, blessed by Isaac, blessed by Laban, blessed by Rachel, blessed by Leah, but he has not been blessed by God, not actually. The favor of God was with him, absolutely, but not an encounter with God. And then he says, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Then God says, who are you? And another first comes from Jacob, a crucial question. When God asks us questions, it is not because he does not know the answer. Oftentimes, it is because we don't know the answer. And this is the first time where Jacob actually, listen, it's the first time where Jacob actually says, I am Jacob. The first time in Jacob's story. You look back to when he was with Isaac. His father asks him, who are you? I'm Esau. I'm Esau. I'm I'm Esau. No, no, no. I'm Esau. I'm Esau. Bless me. I'm Esau. Bless me. I'm Esau. Bless me. I'm Esau. And then his father comes to him a few chapters later, his heavenly father, and asks him the same question. Who are you? I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm I'm the guy who saw that my brother was having a weak point and then I manipulated him out of his inheritance so that I could have it. I'm Jacob. 
I'm, I'm Jacob. I'm, I'm the guy who listened to what my mom was saying, and I tricked my dad into blessing me with a double portion, even though it wasn't mine. I'm, I'm, I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm the Jacob. I'm the guy who's terrified of my family, so I had to run away to my uncle. I'm, I, I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm, I'm Jacob. I'm the guy who actually tricked my uncle because I wanted to be blessed so bad that I did anything and used anybody to make sure that it happened. I'm, I'm, I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm the guy who separated my wives across from me because I'm so scared that my brother is going to kill me. I'm, I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm, I'm the guy who's been manipulating my entire life so that I can be blessed. I'm, I'm Jacob. I'm scared. I'm a manipulator. I'm, I don't know what to do. I want to be blessed, but I don't know how to be blessed. I'm, I'm Jacob. And then God says, yeah, you are. But you are no longer Jacob. And now you are Israel. Listen. When Jacob rightly identifies himself before God, God rightly identifies Jacob. If you want a true identity from God, you need to be alone with him, you need to be empty, and you need to be honest. Go to him. I'm not talking about alone, empty, honest, like, oh, I got a podcast. No podcast. Alone with God. I'm like, oh, I'm alone with God. I got worship music. No, wor- no worship music. Alone with God. I got, I got a devotional. Alone. No, no, no. I got my discipleship part. No, no. I'm talking you by yourself alone with God. And when you do that, friend, he will rightly identify you. He finally, in one moment, actually changes. Why? Because, friend, this is the best news as I close. Christ is the only thing sufficient for change. Christ is the only thing sufficient for change. Listen, it's so important because this. The threat of Esau was not sufficient to change Jacob. The fear of losing his family was not sufficient to change Jacob. The disappointment of not living up to him being the new patriarch was not sufficient to change Jacob. All of those things were happening at the same time, and none of them changed him. And some of us think in this room still today that threat, fear, and disappointment is enough to change you. No, it is not. It never will be. Christ is the only thing sufficient for change. Because as soon as he encounters Christ, everything changes. This moment marks the end of Jacob and the beginning of Israel. And all of a sudden, Jacob is not blessed by Jacob. Jacob is blessed by God. And Jacob realizes, I'm no longer who I was. Now I am only who Christ says that I am. C.S. Lewis says it perfectly in Mere Christianity. He says, until you have given up yourself to him, you will not have a real self. Keep back nothing. Nothing. Nothing that you have give, not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that is not died will ever be truly raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Because only Christ is sufficient for change. Jacob might be who you were created. Jacob might be who you were found to be. But Israel is who you are formed to be. He says, but now. He who created you, O Jacob... And he who formed you, O Israel. Who formed who in this situation? Israel did not form Israel. Yahweh formed Israel. 
made him what he was not. The good news of the gospel is this, that who you once were does not have to be who you will always be. We are saved by grace. We are sustained by grace. We are kept by grace. We are changed by grace. And we will one day be with him. It is not I am saved by grace and sustained by myself. I am saved by grace and sustained by grace. God is the only one sufficient for change. And we look, and some of us in this room, we are seeing and hearing this message, and we're saying, great, I'm going to get rid of Jacob. I'm going to forget Jacob. I'm going to like dismantle Jacob so that God can bless Israel. No! The point of the story is not that you need to get rid of Jacob so that God can bless Israel. The point of the story is that God works through Jacob to form Israel. If you think, I need to change me so that God can form me, you have it wrong, friend. God does not get around Jacob to get to Israel. He's not jumping over Jacob and like, Jacob, get out of the way. He works through through Jacob, and then changes Jacob to Israel. Oh, the beauty of a new identity in the scriptures is when you have a new name, it is a new identity. It's Sarai to Sarah. It's Simon to Peter. It's Levi to Matthew. It's Jacob to Israel. Friend, you, if you are in Christ, and only if you are in Christ, have a new identity. You are no longer Jacob you are Israel. So, who am I? Isaiah 43. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. And who am I? Who are you? You are mine. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord Jesus, we don't want to be anybody else's but yours. And Lord, forgive us for the times. Well, if that's you, you don't have to do anything. Just... Forgive us for the times, Lord Jesus, where we have tried to bless ourselves and we have forsaken your blessing. Oh, Jesus, forgive us for acting like Jacob when we know that we've been made to be Israel. And thank you for encountering us and not forgetting Jacob but redeeming Jacob. If there's anybody in this room who's saying, I feel like Jacob, like I'm not who God called me to be. I'm not acting like God tells me to act. I'm not doing what God tells me to do. I am not behaving and I am not, I am not who God calls me to be. I'm not his, but I really want to be. I want to give you an opportunity to do that today, right now. It's repentance. It's turning away from yourself and turning towards him. And if you're sitting in this room or you're watching online and you're saying to yourself, I am not his, but I absolutely want to be. I want to give you an opportunity Wow, in a moment, you can be his. And you can experience the miracle of a new identity. If you're in this room and you're saying, I want to be his, I want to give my life to Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand right now so I can pray with you. Amen. Amen. I see you. I see you. He sees you. (laughs) He sees you. He sees you. Amen. He sees you. Amen. He sees you. 
And if that's you in this room, he hears your heart. Pray this in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for sinning against you. I choose to turn away from sin and to follow you, the one who died for me and rose for me. I am no longer Jacob in Christ. Now I am yours. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my life. Make me new and make me like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just made that decision, I want to say congratulations because Jesus has changed my life forever. Amen. Yeah, and for the better. And I truly believe he's going to do the same thing for you.